All right, everybody, I think just about everybody's back. Um, so uh, while, uh, while you guys are the last uh, 30 seconds, so coming back, just wanted to um, uh, remind everybody that uh, we have a, or obviously we have a guest speaker now. Um, and I don't know how John prefers to run stuff, but, but when I'm talking, it's very hard for me to ma manage the chat as well as sort of give my talk. So John, I'm gonna give over control to John in a minute. He's gonna run the show. I'll be checking the chat myself. And if there's something um, that I can break in about, I will. But generally speaking, I suspect John will probably prefer you guys to unmute your mic and orally ask a question if you have, if there's something that comes up or something isn't clear. Is that, that true, John Boy? Yeah, feel free to just um, unmute and, and ask your question, particularly if it's if it's yeah something that's you're unclear about or so I don't don't worry about interrupting me. Awesome. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna I like I'd like to welcome everybody officially to uh, and introduce you officially to um, the great Dr. John Lambrinos, professor at Oregon State University. Uh, in now he's he's in their horticulture department. But he's really, even though he loves horticulture and growing things, he's really, his, he cut his teeth on invasion biology. He's an ecologist extraordinaire, plant uh, expert, natural historian, all these fantastic things. John did his undergrad at UC Berkeley. Uh, and then he came down to do his uh, PhD at UCLA with a gentleman who's now retired, but by the name of Martin Cody who was a Robert MacArthur student, so sort of a lion in the, in the 20th century pantheon of ecology. Um, and John uh, uh, did a really cool project for his PhD, um, which we'll hear a little bit about that um, today, but he worked on um, pompous grass and, and how pompous grass does its ecology and how this invasive plant um, uh, survives and, and, and expands and all that kind of good stuff. After uh, graduate school, John went up to be a postdoc at UC Davis and work on another invasive uh, plant, a Spartina, a, a salt marsh uh, invader, um, and worked on that in San Francisco Bay Area and then started creeping up more and more into the Pacific Northwest. And he liked the Pacific Northwest so much, he just said, I'm gonna go up here and be a professor up in the greater Oregon area not because they, they had not legalized uh, or they had not decriminalized mushrooms or, or acid or anything like that at the time, even though now, as of this week, they have. Um, but uh, fantastic university, um, um, Oregon State. Uh, it's, what is it, John? You guys, five, five uh, uh, um, um, land Grant. grant stuff, yeah. the space, air, in the land, A sea, space, land, sea, space, air, energy, energy. Yes. So, uh, so we're going to say one of our fantastic uh, research universities, and um, John is really well positioned. Um, when we started, when we started uh, our careers, the, a lot of these topics were very much traditionally binned, right? And so, um, John is in the horticulture department which is a fantastic place to be because he's not only is he interested in ecology, but he's interested in the management of these issues and not just, not just how these organisms do their do, but how we might be able to manipulate uh, uh, landscapes, how we might be able to do restorations, how we might be able to do food systems in more sustainable fashions and things of that nature. And so it's, it's, um, it's really cool, even though historically, there were fewer options like that. As you guys go forward with your career, there's more and more ways to take our traditional environmental science or ecology or, or whatever our, our disciplinary focus and apply it in more um, nuanced ways and more um, engaging ways. And so I think John's a fantastic example of that. So with that introduction, our, our invasive species expert extraordinaire. Oh, I should also say uh, last year, uh, coronavirus, couldn't do anything. This year, coronavirus can't do anything. But for um, the last, what are we, John, I don't know, 14, 15 years, whatever the heck it is, we've been taking students to New Orleans. And I think John will touch on at least a little bit of that in, at one point in his, in his uh, presentation today. But um, we have a couple students here in Coastal that have already come with us to New Orleans. Um, 
Again, we won't be able to do that trip this coming spring, but I hope that at least some of you are interested and will still be around next, next academic year, wherein we will be returning to New Orleans and would love for you guys to come. And so the very, very first year, John didn't join me, but every single uh, year after that, uh, Dr. Lambrinos has been a key part of that class. So he sometimes brings uh, undergrads from Oregon State. So he sometimes brings graduate students from Oregon State. He sometimes brings other professors from Oregon State. Um, and uh, he, the, the, the class is as much John's as it is mine. And so um, uh, uh, if you guys have questions about that as well, in addition to invasive species, when we're nearing the end, I'm sure he's probably more than, than willing to tell you uh, how crazy our trips are. <laughs> So, and not only that, but John has also joined us when we did our first trip to, um, our only trip to this date, uh, to this point, to the Cook Islands. John was also a part of that. So we collaborate with John and Oregon State University frequently here at CSUCI, a fantastic partner, both in research as well as in teaching. And so um, with that, I'll hand it over to the great Dr. Lambrinos from Oregon State University. Thank you, Sean. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. It's, uh, it's almost like going someplace else. <laughs> I've seen different people, or at least different people's icons. So I'm going to, saying that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually turn off my video because my internet is sketchy and I'm worried that I might overload it. So I'll turn off my video for a moment. Um, let's see, I get my screen up. So um, as Sean said, I've been kind of interested in invasions and I just think invasions are really, really cool and fascinating for a whole number of reasons. One of which is of course, they're one of the ways, they're kind of one of the hallmarks of the Anthropocene. They're one of the ways in which, in which we have been changing the earth system and most particularly the um, biodiversity of the earth system. But they're also, I think, fascinating for a whole wide range of other reasons, particularly since um, they involve kind of humans and human interactions and social aspects and economic aspects of it. Um, so I, I think they're really interesting. And here's, here's kind of our latest introduction. This is our latest COSO introduction, actually. So, um, uh, this is this is a nest being removed in of uh, Asian giant hornet up in Blaine, Washington. So Blaine is right on the coast. I'm not exactly sure where the nest is, but um, I think I think this is the coast. So if you look through those trees, I think that's the shoreline right over there. So it's a coastal invasion. So it's at least started off as a coastal invasion, and I just love this picture because it's sort of indicative of, of I think the crazy things that and the excitement that people get when they when they start thinking about invasions. I'm not sure why these these fancy suits apparently like these suits came from Japan. They're Japanese. The Japanese are very stylish. <laughs> they came from Japan. Here they are they're stuck they they found this they they stuck um a radio transmitter onto a giant hornet and tracked it around for a, a month or so a few weeks finally tracked it to its nest and found the nest. Um, so there's a whole lot to talk about invasions, particularly the management of invasions. So I'm just going to talk, take a little bit of an idiosyncratic um, slice of invasions. And I'm going to start off first talking about some definitions. And um, definitions are not, I don't really like definitions, but um, I think it's important to go over the definitions, at least a couple of definitions for invasive invasive populations, biological invasions, because there's such a diversity of different terms and they're not very consistent. People use different terms, it's, it's kind of a, a mess. So I'm just gonna give you what I think my definitions are, which I think are some good ones to keep in mind. Uh, then I'm just gonna give you some examples of some coastal invaders or invaders that have been particularly troublesome in, in coastal regions, idiosyncratically focused on things that I've, mostly things that I've worked on. Um, and then the kind of the last half of the talk, I'm going to focus on some, I call them management uncertainties, ambiguities, and challenges. So I'm not going to really focus on um, a lot of the things that we know work well or have worked, like good ways of controlling them, 
good ways of doing outreach. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. I'm going to focus more on kind of the challenges we face in part because biological invasions have been really controversial, particularly the management of biological invasions, not only from the perspective of, of the general public, often the general public get um, really concerned or really don't understand management of biological invasions, um, but also from a scientific level, there's been a lot of, particularly recently, kind of debate or discussion about what the best approach for our management of biological invasions should be, particularly in the context of the Anthropocene, the context of all these other things, all these other changes that we're doing to the Earth system. All right, so um, first the definitions. So, and these are really kind of grounded in kind of the ecological definition of what, um, what bio, biological invasions are and why they're so interesting from an ecological standpoint. So I guess you probably all know that, um, you know, the world is for the last um, several millions of years have been, has been isolated, separated by oceans, mountains. And this isolation has meant that we've developed, organisms have developed evolutionarily in kind of isolation from each other, right? So we have these evolutionary neighborhoods. So here's, Here's uh, marine biogeographic realms. So biogeographic realms are sort of one way of defining these, these evolutionary neighborhoods. So these don't have labels on them. But I think this is, if I remember correctly, this is the North Pacific uh, marine realm. I think this is the Eastern tropical Pacific, this one here. Um, and then here's the sort of similar ones in the terrestrial side of things. And, but, one of the things that we've done is that we've we've really diminished these barriers that that created these these evolutionary neighborhoods, and we've done it through a variety of ways. Basically, all the things that we've been doing over the last hundred or two hundred years. So, trading goods with each other, um, intentionally moving species around the world, um, unintentionally having them hitchhike along our travels. And coastal zones have been a real center of this because coastal zones are often, as I, I, I suspect you probably talked about in this class, are centers of economic activity, they're centers of trade, and all those, for those reasons, they're also centers of, of species movements going into and out of them. So here's just one kind of a classic example of this. This is, uh, these, this is a sea lamprey here. Um, it's in the lives in the Atlantic Ocean, and for ever since there was a Niagara Falls, there's Niagara Falls basically right there. Sea lampreys were prevented from going into the Great Lakes um, system, but that all changed in 1829 when we built the Welland Canal, which basically connected the Saint, basically formed a big chunk of the Saint Lawrence Seaway, connected the Saint Lawrence River into the rest of the into the rest of the Great Lakes, and this allowed these sea lampreys to, to get around Niagara Falls basically and go into the Great Lakes. And this had a big effect on the local fish there, primarily because these local fish were not, they weren't adapted to living with sea lampreys, unlike most of the fish in the, in the Atlantic. So a lot of the fish in the Atlantic have kind of uh, have evolved tolerances for sea lampreys, ways of getting rid of the sea lampreys, but that wasn't the case in um, and the Great Lakes, and it, it had a big effect on the fishery. So here's a here's a lake trout in the Great Lakes being attacked by some sea lampreys. All right, so here's the first definition. So, and it relates to this idea that we had these basically species that were in more or less isolation. Of course, there was natural movement sometimes. Natural, uh, there was natural dispersal between these biogeographic realms, but it was relatively rare. And that's increased dramatically since by us, right? By breaking down these barriers. So the, this first definition relates to that. And so this is uh, non-indigenous populations, I call it. It's a self-sustaining population of a species that has been transported outside of its current or historic range by humans. And there's kind of two parts to that. One is that it, it kind of excludes those natural range expansions. It really focuses on the human movement the human facilitation of species across these barriers. And then it also, it usually excludes 
populations that are wholly dependent on us, meaning they're not self-sustaining populations. So things like um, our agricultural crops, right? Um, corn, uh, it, you know, corn growing in Europe is, is a non-indigenous um, species. It's not native to Europe, right? But I don't think most Europeans would think corn, think of corn as, as a non, in a uh, non-indigenous population. So it usually excludes that, but in a strict sense, in a strict sense, um, uh, it really, the, this non-indigenous sort of just simply means a species that isn't native to a region that we, that we move. So you could, many people often include talking about maize as a non-indigenous species. So I just said non-indigenous species, uh, but this brings up a point which is really, <laughs> it's, a, it's a peeve of mine. And I can't say I lost the war because I never fought it, and no one would have, um, no one would have uh, uh, listened to me anyway. But you know, non-indigenous. We, the most common thing to what people say is non-indigenous species, invasive species. But a species is the whole thing, right? A species is all of the populations of a particular species. So a lion in Africa is a lion. A lion in a zoo in the Bronx is a lion, right? They're all part of the same species. So when we're talking about invasions, introductions, we're really talking about specific populations of a species, right? It's a non-indigenous population of a species that's been moved from its, its native range into a different range, right? And so people don't say population, they always say species, but I think it's really important to keep that distinction in mind because, because there's lots of cases, even within, the, even within the introduced range where populations of, have different characteristics, right? And this is one of the things that causes some of the ambiguities in terms of management. So I listed some, there's a whole range of synonyms for non-indigenous basically. So here's one non-indigenous species, that's one that uses the term, this is a common one. Uh, there's some disciplinary sort of um, differences too. So a lot of marine marine science folks use this NIS as a common acronym for non-indigenous non -indigenous species. There's also non-native as a common one, introduced species, naturalized species. There's a whole number of probably less technical terms that are less favored technically, such as weedy. Oftentimes people say weedy species. All right. Um, so that's kind of the first part of the of this kind of a two-part kind of definition. The other one is that when we move species into new um, evolutionary contexts, basically evolutionary and ecologically different contexts, um, it often creates aberrant population dynamics. So um, we often, a species, when it gets moved into a new range, it leaves behind all the predators, all the competitors that had evolved to deal with it. Um, and this can create sort of population explosion. So Charles Zelton, who wrote one of the kind of first books about biological invasions, has a great um, uh, description of them. He calls biological invasions ecological, ecological explosions because you create these, these populations that are, do completely different things in their introduced range than uh, what they were doing in their native range. So here's ice plant. This is just sort of one example, ice plant growing on Pacific, uh, in Pacific Grove, and um, you know, much more widespread and abundant than it often you often see it in its native range in South Africa. <laughs> By the way, on this side, I got this picture from um, it was a a, um, a tourist advertisement for Pacific Grove. It was advertising the annual blooms of the ice plant <laughs> for people to come see the annual blooms of ice plant. I thought it was interesting. All right. Um, I'll, I'll also, I'll put in another video for you guys that I, I wasn't going to put in, but I, I will put in. But um, it's for not Pacific Grove, but it's the other end of Big Sur. It's this Piedras Blancas lighthouse. And they've done such a great job of restoring the coastal bluff, the native vegetation. that It looked just like John's picture to start with. Now it's, it's all this diverse, these diverse natives and shrubs and everything. But what they were finding is that when tourists come, they wouldn't know what what <laughs> what ice plant was. So they reintroduced ice plant in a little like three foot by three foot box so they could demonstrate what it looked like because um, so many people are naive in terms of understanding what plants are and, and they, they didn't understand uh, the difference. But uh, 
but uh, that's awesome. Yeah, good times. <laughs> All right. So the other um, uh, part of this definition is that a subset of those of those non-indigenous populations that have been introduced become abundant and spread widely in their in, in their range. And it's important to keep in mind that this is a subset of those introduced species. So some species that we introduce, or see, uh, you should, um, you get a point for every time you hear me say species instead of populations. Um, so some of those introduced populations basically don't spread very much. They, they remain very rare. Um, they remain, remain very locally isolated. Uh, so not all of them spread and become super abundant. So it's only a subset of those species that do and kind of the definition, the name for those, those types of populations is this invasive population or uh, more commonly invasive species, right? Now, um, as I say down here at the kind of at the, uh, at the bottom here, this definition is one of the ambiguities of this definition is that people often conflate that description of the population. So how abundant it is, how geographically widespread those populations are, right? They conflate that kind of population level description with uh, a measure of impact, right? What has, what has the species done in terms of changing the biodiversity patterns, changing the ecosystem function of a particular place? So this definition often combines those two, but I think for my preference is isn't I think it's good to keep them separate, right? Because not all invasive populations um, have the same level of impact. So just one example is um, dandelion, right? Common dandelion. It's in lawns around the world. So it probably are. It had originally a very widespread uh, distribution just by itself, but it's also been introduced um, basically almost in every place around the world because of us. And, but, you know, you see it in lawns, you maybe see it alongside of a road, it's super widespread, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous, but I don't think people would sort of classify dandelions as being an invasive species, as something that's really causing, uh, really causing a, a problem or having a big effect on ecosystems. So that's why I think it's good to keep this definition separate. I like to call invasive populations as basically description of how widespread they are, how abundant did they get in their native range. And then think about the subset of those populations which are really causing significant problems, significant changes to biodiversity, significant changes to ecosystem function. They don't always completely overlap. All right, and I think that's just one of the other, that's one of the ways that this these kind of defi definitions are a little bit ambiguous and it, and, it, and it comes into play in management and sometimes. All right, so let me show you some, just a, a few examples um, that kind of, I think relate to broad ways in which those, that subset of invasive populations that really exert impacts on ecosystems, kind of the main ways in which they do that. So here's one that uh, Sean, Sean mentioned I worked on. This is Spartina alterniflora. It's a salt marsh grass, intertidal grass. It's a strong ecosystem engineer in the sense that, um, so you can see it's a really thick vegetation. It's right along the coast and all this, any water that travels through it, sediment-laden water that sediment um, uh, deposits out. So when Spartina is present, um, it increases the tidal elevation it has a huge root system, which is a big part of keeping, keeping that sediment in place in a marsh. And uh, so if not for the Spartina here, the, probably the marsh level here would be you know, at least one or two feet um, lower. Uh, it's also been accumulating the sediment over, in some cases, thousands of years. So it's a real change to the ecosystem. Here it is in its native habitat in, ooh, look, I figured out how to do. I have a laser point. <laughs> um, the um, wow, that's so high tech. I like it. <laughs> the uh, this is it in its in its um, uh, native range in the Gulf Gulf Coast. It's one of the things that keeps um, the Gulf Coast a Gulf Coast ecosystem. Right here is in contrast. This is the way most of our 
intertidal habitat looks like on the West Coast. We don't have these big macrophyte plants, uh, angiosperm plants like here. Instead, we have we have microalgae, algae. That's really the primary producers. And so, visually, it looks very different. But think about in terms of kind of energy flow. So this energy, this is being this Spartina is fixing this energy. It's sitting in that biomass, growing over the the course of a year, and then kind of at the end of the year, this time of year, it's starting. It sort of um, in a seasonal place like. Uh, Washington, uh, it, it would it would break off um, and float around. This sort of habitat, the algae is cranking out photosynthesis really quickly. It's, it's turning over really quickly, all right? It's a very kind of different speed and dynamics. Uh, there's a whole different set of species living in mudflats, right? Whole birds have adapted to, to utilizing this resource. And uh, so this Spartina got introduced to the West Coast in a number of places, San Francisco Bay, one of them. Also, this is this picture here comes from Willapa Bay, which is up in Washington. And here's a picture basically completely converted this West Coast ecosystem into something that looks almost exactly like an East Coast ecosystem, All right? Very different, and it's completely transformed that flow of energy, the flow of materials, the, the tidal level here has been, um, has increased at least two to three feet since since Spartina was Spartina was introduced. So it's one a classic example of a strong ecosystem engineer. And these so ecosystem engineers are often um, the species that have the most dramatic impacts when they become when they become introduced into a new range. So here's another kind of aspect of ecosystem engineering. A lot of species of altered disturbance patterns, particularly fire regimes. So a classic story around the world is, is grasses or herbaceous plants in general in, uh, invading woody, woody systems. And these herbaceous plants typically have much more, um, particularly in arid systems. So uh, in arid sort of sh um, shrubland systems, such as in deserts or in this case, chaparral here in San Diego County, the understory, there's kind of very limited understory, uh, but when they get invaded by grasses, the grasses tend to have a lot of more annual biomass that sort of accumulates really quickly. And that biomass is, is like kindling. It's really easy to catch fire. Chaparral is e easily catch fire, but I think about also sort of more in a desert area where a saguaro cactus is not really an easy thing to catch fire. Right, um, and so around the world, when these grasses get into areas, particularly in in arid sort of arid shrubland systems, they've tended to increase the fire frequency. They've created more biomass. They've created more sort of kindling for for biomass, and uh, this this used to be happening also here in in coastal in coastal systems here in California though it's a little bit more complex than that so here's a picture it's a great picture this is in Alpine in San Diego County so this is all of this picture looked like this in just in 1969 so this thing burned in 1970 and it's recovered into this chaparral this section here burned in 1970 and 2001 and this one here burned in 1970, 2001, and 2003. This picture was taken, I think it was in 2013 or something like that. So a common thing that's been happening is that as the fire frequency increases, the ability for these, these perennial, longer-lived shrubs and trees to regenerate uh, gets depressed. And so you get a conversion from what was this into something that now remains permanently grassland. Now, I'll, I'll, I think later on I'll show a slide where it's a, this story is a little bit more complex. So in a case like um, the Sonoran Desert, for instance, which has been invaded by buffalo grass, that buffalo grass has been a real driver. It really changed, completely changed the fire history. Here, it's unclear whether the, these grasses are a reflection of the grasses changing the fire history or a whole range of other things like us changing the fire frequency. And it's probably a much more, there's a complex interaction going on. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so another main way that these, that, um, that organisms affect ecosystems when they get 
introduced into new area is that they directly eat or they directly compete with species. And uh, Peruvian coastal systems islands are particularly vulnerable to this because often um, islands have low overall diversity. They often lack lots of predators and competitors that exist on mainlands. And as a consequence, they often are very naive in terms of here is um, a wandering albatross here on Marion Island. Um, and uh, you can see, you can basically just walk right up to it and um, it, it doesn't mind. It also doesn't, it didn't mind when cats walked right up to it and started eating its eggs. So in, in the 19, 1940s, um, they introduced cats onto Marion Island uh, partly because there were rats that had come on the island and they thought, well, we'll bring, we'll bring cats in <laughs> to get rid of the rats. And the cat population just exploded because there were no predators for the cats. And there were all these seabirds um, that were, all, there were all these seabirds that were, um, uh, uh, that were just sort of sitting ducks for them, basically. Uh, ah, I made a pun. Um, so their oh, cat population exploded. Sitting albatrosses, that's good. <laughs> yeah, sitting albatrosses for them. So the um, cat population exploded. So in the 1970s, there was like 14 cats per square kilometer. Um, and they were killing, this is an incredible number, they were killing half a million diving petrels per year. And this has been a story that's been played out across um, remote, pretty remote islands around the world. All right. So here is um, here's another classic example of this. So it's not simply that that species have um, uh, directly sort of eat other species, right? That, that can ripple through entire ecosystems. And this is a good example. This is a, a brown tree snake, which was introduced to Guam. Uh, basically around World War II as part of, probably it came in on US military supplies, sort of stowed away in a crate somewhere. And Guam, it, there was no snakes on Guam. So all these birds on Guam had no idea what was about to come at them with this snake. And basically the snake, not, not overblowing things very much, it ate all the birds on Guam. Basically almost all the birds on Guam have gone extinct, native birds have gone. <laughs> of Guam, went extinct, all these guys down here um, because they basically got eaten by the brown tree state. Now, not only did we lose the biodiversity of these birds, but these birds, many of them were frugivores and they played critical roles in dispersing the native, the native trees on Guam. So here's a study that compared, um, looked at the effects of this in terms of dispersal of these tree seeds and also seed rain in, they compared Guam here with these other islands, uh, nearby islands that didn't, weren't invaded by the tree snake. And you can see, so this is um, a measure of dispersal distance. This is islands with birds. This is islands without, um, uh, without birds basically on Guam for two different tree species. And then the, uh, so on Guam, basically the, they're, the long distance dispersal is much reduced. Most of the tree seeds are falling near to the parent tree. And then this is overall seed rain um, compared with islands with birds compared to islands um, without birds. So it's more dramatic in this picture. So you can see basically all the seeds are just right here, right? And the, the study went on to show that this is having a big effect on recruitment. So basically all these trees are uh, there old trees have been there, the adults are still there, but there's almost no recruitment. There was drastically less recruitment. So these forests are basically in dire straits because of this one, one uh, uh, introduction of the brown tree snake. All right, so of course, um, the other kind of aspect of biological invasions is that these changes to ecosystems that they uh, cause uh, affect human well-being in various ways, some of them very direct ways. So um, I'm in a horticulture department and our entomologist seems like every, I don't know, every three or four years, there's a new introduced pest which comes into Oregon and threatens 
the Oregon agriculture industry in some way. And so every three or four years, our entomologist completely rechanges his, their, his, his research agenda to focus on this new introduced pest. And um, this is a particularly imp important problem, not only for like big agriculture, big relatively wealthy agriculture in places like the US, but around the world. So this is came from a estimate that came out a few years ago that looked at just the impact of five pests in um, East, East Africa. So I think it was like three or four countries in East Africa. And their estimate was that these pests um, caused a, a billion dollars per year in economic losses. And most of those economic losses fell on smallholder farmers like these folks here growing, growing maize. So here's another um, example of this. This is, um, uh, also from Africa, this is um, these are acacia species, basically Australian acacia species that have been introduced to, to South Africa. Uh, this is Finbos, which is kind of the South African version of chaparral. It's a great example of convergent evolution, sort of uh, kind of a mix between chaparral and coastal sage scrub, kind of. And the the introduction of these acacia species. These acacia species are much deeper rooted and they uh, evaporate transpire to a much greater extent than these native shrubs. And so here's a study which has looked at the effect on runoff. So this is mean annual reduction in the runoff. So basically the water availability in these catchments. So, so uh, this, you can see most of these areas, probably the areas, these, these basins right along the coast have had almost a third now have a, almost a third less water available to them because of these acacia species introductions. Um, all right, so because of these, so can I, John, can I just interrupt you real quick um, and just say so that so that's a good example of some of the things, oh, yeah. some of the things we've been mentioning about um, in terms of sustainability and in terms of coastal management, all these things, sea level rise, whatever it's going to be. Oftentimes the the largest fraction of the downsides of whatever comes from the action are borne by the folks that are, have the least capacity to deal with it, right? The most disenfranchised folks, the poorest folks, the folks with least access or the lowest access to, to technologies or chemicals or, or financial support or whatever. And so that's, uh, that's really, really important for us to understand. And so when we talk about these issues that Again, we traditionally sometimes think of in the biological or, or non-human realm, um, there's direct influence on the human realm, but disproportional influence on different parts of the human realm. So yeah, go ahead, keep going, John Boy. I just was, wanted to emphasize that. Yes, very good point. Um, all right, so because of all these, these uh, impacts, and we have, I've only given you a, uh, a few examples, but we have a, a huge amount of evidence and examples, unfortunate examples from a whole wide range of systems, not just coastal systems around the world of these very strong impacts on ecosystems that introduced populations have had. Um, and uh, most of them, many of them have been, have directly and negatively affected human well-being in various ways. So invasive populations have become a big part of our, our management. And I just listed a few kind of ways of you know, we we put a lot of resources into trying to interdict, stop the flow of of species around the world. We put a lot of effort in once populations have established in a in a new range of controlling populations. Um, it's invasive population management is is now intricately tied and a key part of whenever we do restoration. We have to consider consider that. Um, there's a big part of outreach and education uh, involved, and uh, we have we structure many of our policies in terms of coastal management now specifically include and think about invasive population management as part of their of their structures. Um, and so I think you know it's easy to sort of see them as you know invasive populations are are these are this big important thing we're doing with. And we're doing a lot of efforts to try and control and manage them. But um, I think it's good when we think about this management to, to explore some of the 
the uncertainties, ambiguities, and, and challenges that have arisen when we've been doing this management. As I said at the beginning, I think partly because invasive species management has been controversial in, in, in some ways, both from a scientific level, but also just from how people perceive uh, in, invasive species management. All right, so here, so here's an example of, um, of, of this, of some of the controversies. This I just is a random selection of articles I just, I just pulled. So here's, um, um, you know, people just discussing things about why people often, uh, the general public is often against invasive species management. Uh, this is a paper I'll, I'll mention. I'll talk a little bit about this paper, um, talking about the need to sort of listen and include indigenous voices of, of indigenous people's voices in when we're thinking about management. And these two here, so uh, it's not just sort of controversies from the perspective of the general public, it's been a scientific controversy. So this is, so here's, this is a paper that came out in 2011. Um, Don't judge species on, the, on their origins, talking about kind of basically in various ways saying that we should reframe this idea of really focusing on the fact that that origin, that, that first part of that definition, that we move species from one biogeographic realm into another, that, that's the important thing, right? That we should maybe maybe not emphasize that as much. And these are not crazy Yahoo people. The authors on this paper are some, are, are, are um, eminent ecologists, and many of them are eminent, eminent invasive species ecologists. So Gerhard Verme wrote some of the first, um, uh, papers on, on species migrations and species movement. But there's been sort of a backlash. And this is a paper basically of, of scientists saying that, the, that, that those sorts of things are, are kind of equivalent to climate change denialism. And so they weren't maybe direct, there's been other people who are kind of more from the social science realm which, which have criticized invasive species management who have basically said, you know, the evidence for the, the fact that invasive species or invasive populations um, cause such impact is not really there. And there's been this, you know, people saying that's just denialism and that we're, you know, you know it's basically akin to saying that we're not having climate change, right? So there has been a, a fairly big, even on a scientific level, um, controversy and discussion. So I'm not going to explore. It's a whole big topic in and of itself. Uh, it's interesting just by itself. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to cover that um, here. I'm just going to focus on I think two two aspects of this, which I think are um, uh, which are I think some are part of the kind of the core of where a lot of these ambiguities and sort of arguments come from. And the first one is that when it introduced population gets um, arrives into a new into a new area, the, the impacts on those ecosystems, the changes it causes to ecosystems are not often very simple. They're complex, they're context dependent. We often have a very hard time kind of figuring out what is going on exactly. And then, so I'll give you some examples of that. And then the second one is that uh, we humans value species, specific organisms, specific organisms very differently. They're very differently. I mean, just consider your reaction to if you saw, if you saw, um, if you walked out of your house this morning and saw a rat looking at you versus if you saw a little kitten looking at you, right? So we value them in very different ways. And this, this gets um, um, uh, factors into this. So I'll, I'll start off with this um, the, the fact that the impacts or the changes these populations cause are complex. And I'll kind of focus on two things that they vary over space and time. And they also interact with all the other changes that were occurring in the Anthropocene. All right, so here's one example. This is the other, as Sean mentioned, this is what I looked at for my dissertation. This is pampas grass. And in the late 1800s, it was grown commercially uh, for these plumes. So these are the dried plumes of the pampas grass. Um, here, this is um, on Joseph Sexton's farm in Goleta. So you can actually go see Joseph Sexton's house. It's still, it's still there. It's actually almost, it's sort of right off the freeway. So you get off the freeway to go to Goleta. Um, it's right there. You can go see, I think it's a museum. I'm not sure it's open. I think you can make an appointment with the Santa Barbara Historical Society to go see it. 
So um, in the 1800s, it was grown basically as, as an agronomic crop, right? And at the time, no one was thinking that, you know, this is going to be an invasive species. It's another crop. It's another crop like peaches or almonds, right? Um, these plumes were grown. Here's an example of how these plumes were used. This is from uh, the La Fiesta de Los Angeles in 1896. So it got shipped to Europe. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a basically a commercial crop, right? No one's thinking that this is going to be uh, a problem for us. And here, it's here is another use that it was um, uh, used for. This is uh, as an ornamental plant. So this is Golden Gate Park in San Francisco in the 1800s. Very soon after it was first built, I think that Stowe Lake, if you know San Francisco uh, Golden Gate Park, I think that Stowe Lake there was built for irrigation. Um, interesting. Almost everything in this picture is non-native. So this is like a cabbage palm. There's there's Pampas grass, Cortisaria celloana. Most of these birds are either non-native or they're kind of hybrid, um, the hybrid domesticated species. There's this might be a coot, so that might be a native species. There it might be a coot. Um, there's turf grass here. Uh, so even this early on, we we were transforming, particularly our urban landscapes, into using a whole wide range of species. So at this time, so this cabbage palm was not an invasive species, it's still not an invasive species, right? But this one has, right? And so at this point in time, it's very difficult for us to say, oh, we gotta, we gotta watch this one, right? We gotta set up uh, an interdiction, we gotta control its management, we gotta, we gotta really keep an eye on this one, but not this one, right? And we've made a little bit of advances, but not really. Um, basically, the only advance we've made is that we have a lot more track record We've moved a lot more species around the world. And so we know that the species has been invasive in other places, right? And that's how it gets on a list, right? Not because we know innately that this is somehow different from this guy, right? So that's one. And then here it is, here's another picture of, this is a little bit later, here's where it is becoming invasive here in California on Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, and it, but here's a picture of it in Washington. And um, uh, it's again, it's sort of unclear whether this is a really big problem. You see it occasionally in Washington, up in Washington state, in like a place like this, like a real disturbed field, right? Um, and it's unclear whether this is just sort of the beginnings of an incipient, more serious problem, or it really is you know, it's only going to be in a place like this, a really highly disturbed area. So that's sort of one aspect of this. Here's another kind of, um, here's another version of this. So in... Okay, John, can I just interrupt real quick? I'll say another one of the introductory videos um, on our on our readings is, is a time-lapse, about a minute and a half time-lapse video of me driving uh, to one of our stops on um, what would be our normal coastal trip on Big Sur. And uh, just to illustrate how many pompous grass individuals are, are on the coast. And so when you watch that, you're looking for, as John's been pointing out, all those, those uh, white tufty plumy inflorescences. And um, it really is massively dramatic in terms of that part of our coast, how, how many individuals are, are there now. And when I was a kid, uh, you know, 40 years ago, there was nothing close to that abundance um, in, in a lot of those areas. So, so that, that video is non-narrated, it's just a, mm -hmm. just a silent one, but, but watch it and, and see if you can pick out how many plumes are, are on the sides of the road and on the hillsides on PCH. Sorry, go ahead, John. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's, a, here's kind of another um, aspect of, sometimes it's unclear to, to, to sort of categorize whether the effects are bad or not. So one of the early um, things that we've been seeing as a consequence of climate change is that uh, species are moving polewards. And one of the classes of species have been lots of tropical fish, mostly tropical herbivorous fish. And kind of one of the big differences between temperate marine zones and tropical marine zones is there's a lot more herbivores in the tropics. And as a consequence, there's a lot less kind of standing algae in the tropics compared to 
temperate zones. So here's an example. This is, Medi this is in the Mediterranean. This rabbit fish has moved into the Mediterranean for two reasons. One, climate change has made it possible, but also the Suez Canal opened the connection between uh, in from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. And so for basically, I, think, I forget when the Suez Canal was built, but 100 years, a little bit more than that, um, nothing happened, par par partly because it was too cold in the Mediterranean. But the combination of those two have produced this invasion and is produced this real shift from these, there's a, lots of algae here to in areas where these rabbit fish have colonized to basically denuded lots of this algae and created this real tight shift here. This, this is looking at biomass, species richness, fish biomass with, uh, with no rabbit fish, with rabbit fish. The same thing's been happening in Australia, but the picture is a little bit more nuanced in Australia. So these, uh, uh, first, there's no Suez Canal. So these are, this is all sort of natural, quote unquote, migrations of these species um, uh, poleward. And so they've, this study looked at a bunch of different locations and at each of the locations, they could find sites that had um, basically just their temperate fish, uh, but also had a mixture of temperate and more tropical fish. And they looked at, this is um, browsing intensity. This is of seagrasses. This is browsing intensity of algae. And this is uh, grazing intensity. And you can see at some locations, the intensity of that grazing or browsing increased dramatically when you get, when you get tropical fish there. But in lots of other cases, there is no big difference between them. The other thing they noticed is that one thing that happened is that the overall biodiversity, the diversity of fish, also the functional diversity of, of these communities increased when these fish moved, these tropical fish moved in. And you know, we know that diversity, pretty functional diversity helps instill resilience. Um, and so maybe they argued potentially that in some cases, these, these reef communities may have become more resilient to future climate change because of these migrations of fish in there. All right, uh, so here's another, this is sort of an a, a example. I mentioned that this fire situation, the invasion of um, grasses and herbaceous species in, in Chaparral is, is kind of, um, it's a little bit unclear because there's a whole wide range of other things which have been affecting the fire, um, a fire frequency and response to fire patterns here in coastal California. So things like uh, the legacy of pre-European fire management in these systems, ozone pollution, nitrogen pollution, physical disturbances, um, the urban wildland interface. I think Sean showed you, uh, uh, there's a good drone video of this uh, urban wildland interface and um, the way it affects um, species migrations here. Uh, climate change, of course, has been another thing. And one of those things is that there's also these non-native plant populations in here, right? So it's unclear whether, you know, is this simply that we get lots of these non-native guys in here after a fire? Is that a, is that a function of the changes these non-native guys have caused? Or is this a, a symptom of this broader disease of basically all this other stuff here, right? And on a, on a more practical level, it affects sort of our management options, right? So this is a, this is a, a picture uh, in Ventura County where they did a control burn to get rid of this uh, Bromus deandrus. And instead of getting rid of the Bromus deandrus, they did get rid of it, but what came in was mustard. <laughs> so it didn't really exactly work as they intended. Um, here is uh, another kind of complication is that when we're doing restoration or basically managed trying to get rid of the invader. When we get rid of the invader, uh, it, the, the ecosystem often doesn't recover as simply the reversal of back to a time before the invader was there. And that's because there's lots of complex interactions. So a, sort of a classic example of this comes from another um, kind of remote uh, sub-Antarctic island. This is Macquarie Island. We got, uh, in this case, both um, cats and rabbits were, were introduced. The cats were eating up all the seabirds. The rabbits were eating all the native plants. And so they started a control program. They introduced myxomatoma virus to try and control the rabbits. And then they eradicated all the cats. They actually got rid of all the cats on the island. And the seabirds were very happy. But what happened is this triggered a tropic cascade, basically. The cats were controlling the rabbit populations to some degree. Without the cats, the rabbit population exploded again. 
and ate all the plants. So here's a picture. This is plus cats, 2001, minus cats. Uh, you can see all these sword ferns, giant ferns are now kind of basically dead. This is plus cats, minus cats. There's kind of some other complications in here. The, the myxomatoma virus, uh, because it's so it's a sub-Antarctic island, it's so cold, basically they had to reintroduce the virus every year. And then it got costly and then so they skipped years and things like that. So their myxomatoma control was probably also was also not very good. Um, but here's another I'll, here's another example. Of this this is Spartina again, and in San Francisco Bay, uh, Spartina um, there's this um, California clapperail, threatened California clapperail. It actually likes to to nest in in vegetation that's slightly higher than the surrounding marsh elevation. So exactly the type of thing that Spartina does. It creates cover, vegetated cover, and it raises the tidal elevation. So they were nesting here. And there was a control problem to get rid of the Spartina. And the idea was, we'll get rid of the Spartina, and we'll go to the bare soil, and then we'll get, we'll get native meadows back. And when these native meadows come back in, the clapper rail will be, will be fine, will be happy. But it, you know, for various reasons, the management approach was, we're going to get rid of all the Spartina first. We have the money, we've got to get rid of all the Spartina. And then got went to bare soil. And when that happened, there was a 50% decline in, in clapper rails. And this sounds sort of obvious in retrospect, but this comes from a study, a modeling study. They tried to figure out what, what the optimal approach was. And this sounds kind of simple now in retrospect, but the optimal approach was not get rid of all the Spartina as quick as possible. And, but instead do it much more slowly and couple it with, with restoration. So do, take out some invasive Spartana, do some native meadow. So maybe over a period of, of something more like, more like 25 years instead of five years, which was what the schedule was, right? This is, this is the way that we can keep clapper rails happy and move back into native meadows. Um, here's sort of another, this is another example. This is another grass, this is um, European Dune grass, Amophila species. This is a picture in Long Beach. There's no Amophila. Uh, it's kind of hard to see this picture, but basically there's not a huge big dune here, right? This is basically the dune here. Um, it's not a huge dune. And when Amophila, it's another ecosystem engineer, it increased, really increased, it stabilized the dune and it increased the dune height. But it also got rid of all the nesting habitat for rest and snowy plover, which likes to nest in this sort of habitat, right? So. Another management approach, the idea was we're going to go and we're going to bulldoze all this, all this amophila out and uh, to create nesting habitat for snowy plovers. And this is a, from a study that looked at what, sort of what happened after 20 years. And it, uh, from the standpoint of snowy plovers, it helped. Uh, the amophila cover decreased um, and the plover cover increased, but it also reduced native plant richness and abundance and also interfered with the kind of dune dynamics. So these dunes are dynamic. They come in, they move around. And every year, if you go in every year, every few years and bulldoze a dune again, that sort of disrupts that. Um, uh, the other kind of thing, which isn't directly related to the biology, but these, these amophila, um, when you get rid of it, you lower the dune height. So you drastically lower the, the storm protection that those dunes provided. And uh, so the recognition, again, it sounds, it sounds good in retrospect, was well, we should have done this much more um, slower, right? Instead of using bulldozers, we should have more expensively done hand pulling or used herbicides. Um, and maybe think about this in a much more broader ecosystem way. And maybe, so this is in Long Beach, Washington. We're not going to get rid of the dune in front of Long Beach, Washington, because we like that storm protection that it provides, right? But in other places, maybe up here at the north at Ledbetter Point, we could get rid of the dunes. All right, um, I'm sort of running out of time, but I'll sort of go quickly go well, through. We have plenty of time, John. We have plenty of time. Can can we can we go back to one quick thing before we keep going? Can we go oh, yeah. back mm -hmm. to little Spartina? Yep. So just uh, maybe you said it and I just missed it, but just so so some of you are in my restoration class and some of us have talked about this, but just to be clear, there's there's the native Spartina and the non-native Spartina. And, um, and so uh, we're not talking about, the native meadows aren't necessarily Spartina free meadows. They're just another 
another um, version of the species, another another uh, species in the genus um, that might uh, the, or, or that historically was there in that site. It's just been overrun by this non-native. Do you want to talk a little it, bit about that? Yeah. So in fact, it's actually it's uh, interesting. So it's Spartina foliosa, which is a native Spartina here on the West Coast. And it, it's range is basically from San Francisco Bay down, down to about halfway to down the Baja Peninsula. And, but it, it, this actually picture, this is not foliosa, it's alternate flora, but it kind of looks like foliosa. This is kind of how you see Spartina foliosa. It's a few little clumps here and there. Um, whereas, you know, I showed you that picture from Washington of that vast meadow. Spartina foliosa, the native foliosa doesn't, Spartina doesn't form those big kind of vast meadows. Um, uh, but what happened in San Francisco was that native foliosa hybridized with Spartina alterniflora, which is the introduced Spartina from the East Coast. And so everything that's spreading in here, this is not Spartina, actually, uh, this is not Spartina alterniflora. This is probably a hybrid version of Spartina foliosa and alterniflora. And um, so that, that hybrid version is what's been spreading. And so the, the control effort was focused on this hybrid Spartina, not the native Spartina, which kind of kind of looks grows more like this. And then you get these more native meadows that involve well, lots of other things like um, pickleweed, um, baddest, that sort of thing, right? All right. Um, so it, 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 that that's really cool and interesting and weird, right? Normally, when things hybridize. They don't, they don't, um, so, so in, it, this particular um, plant is so problematic because the hybrid is actually way more fecund, is way more productive than the native. So normally when, when something crosses, when something breeds with another species, right, as we've learned with the biological species concept and all that, is, is it either doesn't make offspring or if it does make offspring, they're sterile or they're, they're partially sterile, but in this case, for whatever magical genetic combinations happen, these guys are super reproducers. These are super growers, super reproducers. So we made like a Frankenstein kind of plant um, in this. Yeah, it was super cool. There's actually it created a hybrid swarm. So there's some of these that are super um, uh, fecund. They also the the they were self the Spartina alternate flora is self incompatible. So it has to outcross, it has to, it has to uh, get pollinated from another plant. But the, some, of these, some of these hybrid forms have evolved self compatibility so they can self fertilize themselves. But in the same population, there are also uh, individuals, hybrid individuals, hybrid forms that were teeny, they look like turf grass. There's a huge variety of different forms that emerge from this hybrid swarm there or getting sorted out through natural selection in San Francisco Bay, which is really kind of a fascinating story by itself. And, and, and we and we intentionally shipped them around, right? It was early on, it was sort of a, a colonial uh, or, an, or an empire uh, a tool, yeah? Yeah, so in, well, in San Francisco, the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers planted it to reclaim, to to uh, stabilize wetlands, uh, basically, and to create storm protection uh, behind those wetlands. Um, in Willapa Bay, it was, it was probably accidental. It came in on oysters that they shipped in from the East Coast and was probably packed in Spartina. Cool. All right, so, um, so those are kind of, I, sort of went kind of quickly through it, some of the um, uh, kind of technical reasons why, why um, it's often difficult to either predict invasions, right? Um, or also to understand kind of what their impact is and then also um, to design sort of appropriate methods for, do for doing um, management and control of them. But another sort of, Interacting with all of those technical reasons are this sort of broader idea that we that we value um, we value species and ecosystem services differently, and this this sort of interacts with management in a number of different ways. So here's one of them, which is that um, we often 
we, as I mentioned, you know, we value things like kittens much more so than we value things like rats. So I'm, so there's not too many people who get upset if you say we're going to try and eradicate rats from this area, but they'd get very upset if you said we're going to try and eradicate cats. So this is, um, you've probably been, you probably, many of you probably gone up to the Port Wainimi lighthouse up by uh, the entrance to the port there and seen this feral cat population. It's a lady feeding it there. My mom lives in Port Wainimi. That's not my mom though. Um, she doesn't feed the cats as far as I know. Um, <laughs> Other ones uh, are uh, eucalyptus is another great example, right? People, and it, this is even maybe even a more, uh, uh, I like this example better because so, you know, it's un sort of unclear, is eucalyptus really a bad thing, right? For the ecology of cow, or has it sort of augmented <laughs> the, the ecology of cow? It's now become sort of an iconic part of, of California. I know when I first went to the Bay Area, the, one of the first things I noticed about the Bay Area was, wow, what's this smell? It smells incredible here. And that was eucalyptus, right? So there's been debates about whether we should get rid of eucalyptus because it's a non-native species, right? Why are we having eucalyptus in our cities? We should have native trees. Um, horses are another, uh, are another example of this. Um, and um, no, I think it's important also to, to keep in mind that we have different cultures have kind of value, have different valuations of species and, and more broadly different concepts of, of how we value nature. And oftentimes, you know, I think particularly management agencies kind of reflect, have reflected the dominant culture. Oh, for one, one thing, it's easy to sort of kind of, kind of laugh at crazy cat people, right? You want to go feed the cats, right? But um, it's another thing to, I think you should keep in mind that it's not just sort of, you know, you know, sort of individuals, sort of crazy individuals. It really reflects in many ways, deep uh, and, and important cultural differences that we often have. So uh, there's been a, a more recognition that conservation management agencies have failed to take into account local people when they're when they're thinking about these management decisions. So here's an example. This is um, from British Columbia. This is I put this pronounce <laughs> I put that pronunciation there so that I would remember how to pronounce the name of this first nation. It's the Hene Guatin in British Columbia. And so there, there was this controversy on, on managing horses, which we've seen you know, we see this lots of places. But in this case it was the other sort of wrinkle was it involved uh, this first nation. And horses are very important economic and cultural value to them. Even though they're not native, they developed, they became very economically and culturally in, important to the, this First Nation. And in fact, there's a the history of it is that, is that when white settlers arrived in this region, one of the ways in which they, they, they instituted their power and their control was to, was to limit access to horses, deny access to horses. And so there's this history there. You can imagine of, of the, the, what the Canadian research agencies going to them in 2000 and saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to control and manage your, these wild horse populations. It did not go down very well at all. So it's that, that sort of historical aspect of it. The other aspect of it was that they, the, these, uh, these this, this culture had a very different view of, of kind of these populations than the than European culture or really the, the management, the folks in the management agency did. The management agency sort of classified horses along this very uh, distinct gradient. There was like domesticated horses, you know, lived on a farm and there's these feral horses that kind of like those cats in Port Wainimi, they're, they, you know, we feed them, they're kind of half wild, half, half domesticated. And there's these like, wild populations that never really encounter humans very much. But the, the um, Hene Guatin didn't view this, this distinctions very clearly. They, in fact, they, they more looked at horses as individuals or, or in populations as, as individuals. And so some wild populations they thought were, um, you know, uh, were friendly or they sort of, they knew them as individuals. They didn't see this distinction at all. 
right? And so when you when the Imagine's Angel says, "Oh, we're gonna we're not worried about domestic horses. We're just worried about these guys." They didn't see that these wild horses. They didn't see or understand that distinction at all. All right. So here's an example of where um, uh, basically in the same in the same province nearby uh, of something of a more cooperative interaction. So this is on Haida Gwaii, part of the, or um, the European name for it is the Queen Charlotte Islands, right? Um, it's introduced rats and Sitka black-tailed deer, and that has significantly degraded the, the plants and ecosystems on, on these islands, principally sort of limiting and hindering regeneration of forests on these islands. Um, and so um, the, the First Nations here and the management agencies have sort of developed a cooperative working arrangement to develop a way of managing things. And it's sort of complicated by things sort of similar to the horses and that the deer had become kind of an important food source and had been incorporated into Haida culture in various ways. And so this plan has um, took into account those, uh, those needs and those desires and they've developed a real sort of work cooperative working relationship, which the sort of upshot of it is they're creating this predator exclusion zone in this section in the core in, in the several areas in the core part of where the national reserve is. So there's several sites here they're creating sort of predator free reserves that will help to foster the this ecosystem recovery. All right, so also kind of an aside, these predator exclusions have become, are becoming more uh, popular uh, as, as a management tool to basically create areas, refuges, where that are free of these invasive predators. So here's an example. This is from Oahu, um, where they've created this uh, enclosure or exclosure, depending on your point of view, and they, they either transport they transplant um, birds here, or they try and get them to land within the enclosure. They put these decoys out. But as you can imagine, these fences often are controversial, either because they, they sort of clash. In the case of Hawaii, they clashed with sort of the traditional land management systems or watershed-based land management systems that didn't really recognize fences as sort of a completely alien thing in traditional land management in Hawaii, but even beyond sort of native Hawaiians, lots of people look at a fence like this, like, this is not nature. You mean you're going to put a fence around Hawaii? <laughs> it, that's, a, that's a park. That's like going to the zoo. That's not nature, right? There's very different strong opinions about things. Uh, and, you know, fence is one thing, but all forms of that, using herbicides, right, using a bulldozer to get really a mafla, uh, often uh, people, that clashes with people's view of what nature is or what our relationship with nature should be. All right. Uh, sometimes that um, uh, uh, there's also sort of economic things. Oftentimes, invasive populations provide direct economic benefits, and people are using those direct uh, economic benefits. So if you come and say we're going to get rid of them, they say, "Wait a second, we're not. You're going to get rid of them. We depend on that for our livelihoods." And this is just one example that Sean uh, alerted to me to. This was in the LA Times yesterday, I think. Um, so Catalina. Um, plans to, they've, these bison that are on Catalina, uh, they've been, they've, the plan to thin the, the herd has been controversial because sort of Catalina argues that this is an important tourist draw and it's an economic value of having these herds around. All right, so I'm just going to quickly cover, sorry for going sort of over, I'm going to cover um, a few emerging approaches. I say some of these are emerging, but uh, some of them are still, most of them probably are still controversial in various ways. Uh, and one of them is, I, met, I showed you that, that clip from that paper in the beginning. People say, you know, maybe we should, at least in some cases, not be too hung up about the evolutionary origins of a species or a population. Particularly in the context where we're losing biodiversity, right? We're losing biodiversity. We're rearranging biodiversity because of climate change. The world is getting mixed up for a whole lots of other reasons. And maybe in some cases, you know, the fact that um, the fact that something isn't native, sh we shouldn't really be too 
hung up on it, unless it's particularly if it's it's providing important benefits like important services. So one idea related to this is this is this idea of rewilding. There's kind of different versions of this idea, but one kind of the most dramatic versions is that people say we should reintroduce, uh, say, for to North America things like tigers and lions, which went extinct here in North America, and but they have analogs, ecological analogs in other parts of the world. And that maybe we should think about conserving kind of motifs like a, a grassland ecosystem that had lots of roaming, free roaming herbivores and lots of big top predators, many of which we've, we've changed over the years. And maybe we should we, we introduce those functions and not be worried about, you know, whether the it's a lion as opposed to something else, right? So um, here's a pygmy mammoth, which was living in the Channel Islands, um, went extinct, probably at the end of the Pleistocene in the Channel Islands. It, it's unclear why it may have been gone extinct because of us. We may have actually overhunted it. And people say, well, what's the difference between a bison and a mammoth? It's the same thing, right? Why are we all worried about getting rid of the of bison's on counting, it was just it was pygmy mammoths there twelve thousand years ago. We probably got we probably killed them anyway, right? Uh, so here's an actual example. This is uh, comes from Mauritius. So in Mauritius had a whole bunch of of native species that we that we um, extirpated. So it's things like this um, parakeet here um, and this uh, very large giant tortoise. So there's, there was about five species of giant tortoise on Mauritius, all of which went extinct, we killed them. And um, uh, so uh, managers have reintroduced a tortoise, not native, but from uh, a, uh, 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 another island in this, in this chain in the Indian, Indian Ocean. So not terribly close by, but sort of a related island, a uh, different species with the idea of restoring the functions that were lost when that giant tortoise was um, went extinct. So basically the herbivory and that seed dispersal functions. And so it's partly, it's kind of twofold. One is to restore, restore those functions to Mauritius and also as a way to preserve this giant tortoise which only exists on one teeny island and to double and sort of multiply the, the redundancy of where it exists in the world, right? All right, so the other, another example of this um, or aspect of this is that, uh, you know, we should really think when we're thinking about managing invasive populations, think about them in the long term and as part of complex ecosystems and complex ecosystems that are in many ways are completely new and are new within the last hundred years or so. And not simply kind of have a reflexive reaction to them as being well, all invaders are bad. So we have to get rid of them as soon as possible. So I gave you some examples of the the the, um, uh, the plover example and um, the, the clapper rail example are sort of a uh, an aspect of this, where the where the maybe the better management option would be to go much more slowly and have a maybe a 50 year time frame. Uh, so some examples, but it's even more, here's a, this is uh, the area where um, where we go. This is in, in Louisiana. This is English turn. This is uh, uh, French quarters in New Orleans over here. French quarters probably right over here. And all this is sort of the, is the forced, remnant little, remnant little patch of forest here. We can see it's surrounded by <laughs> lots of urbanization. The golf course right in the middle of it. Um, it's been completely, its environment has completely been transformed. It has a completely different hydrology than it used to have, it has a completely different mixture of species as both native and non-native species in a uh, novel combination. But even though it's sort of this, as um, one of our colleagues, Tom Huggins, one of our colleagues, he refers to it as a Franken forest because it doesn't really have any real analog to any of the historical forests or other forests that still exist, more intact forests that still exist in this region. But it still provides some important services. It's, it provides some habitat for birds, migratory birds, it provides storm protection. And uh, so we're the, our partner, our nonprofit partner, one of the things that it's that the nonprofit's been doing is been trying to remove some of these natives. But we have they have data that says you see, on the short term, when we remove those natives, it actually diminishes the habitat quality for those birds, right? Which brings up sort of a broader conceptual idea. You know, should we be worrying then about those 
about those non-native species in this particular place, maybe we should just sort of let it alone and let it keep functioning, uh, providing that function for bird habitat. If, if in order to get to anywhere different, it's gonna take 50 years or a hundred years. And of course, this is in the context where, where this entire coastline is eroding at a rate that's probably comparable to that time frame, right? All right. Um, I think this is, um, and this is a kind of, uh, not, um, I realize I sort of am ending on a kind of a pessimistic <laughs> note, which I didn't intend to do. But another aspect of it, people have argued, it says, you know, we're in this crazy time. We're losing biodiversity everywhere. As I said, you know, we're rearranging everything. And uh, maybe we really should, instead of focusing, we got to really focus hard and make hard decisions and do triage, right? We got to figure out where, what places we want to save, what places we really want to invest our time and resources. And they argue, some people argue, going around and, ref and trying to get rid of every single invader everywhere is not the right way. And, and it, this is sort of kind of just one uh, probably example that uh, some folks have used. So this is Hawaii. And since uh, Polynesian, since human colonization, first Polynesian 1600 years ago, um, we've lost 51 of Hawaii's native birds. In fact, so many you can buy a book <laughs> to, to learn about all the birds that we lost in Hawaii. Uh, but that net change has involved 56 introductions and 107 extinctions. But if you look at a different time frame, sort of since European colonization, we've had kind of 55 introductions. This one over here, I think is a chicken. It's a sort of, we're unclear, it's probably a chicken. There may have been one more, a minor bird, but at least a chicken. Um, and then, but we've had 23 extinctions. So it's actually been, a, we've had a net gain of 32 species. And it's even more dramatic if you look at the plants. So in the plants, um, there's been a thousand, uh, 90 introductions, only 71 extinctions. And so we've gained, we basically doubled the flora, this, uh, the species, the plant species on Hawaii since European colonization. And I should point out in, in the case of the birds, none of these bird extinctions, uh, were, um, probably almost all of them, none of them were due to the bird introductions. They were due to other things, land use change, overhunting, those sorts of things. So from this perspective, there's kind of two conflicting perspectives here. On one hand, this is a tragedy, right? We lost 70% 70, 70 of Hawaii's native birds. 170 of them were unique. They, they, they only existed on Hawaii. So the world, we've lost um, 107 species that were unique to the world, right? Also, another, another aspect of that, Hawaii is now kind of less unique than it is it now looks more like lots of other tropical places around the world, right? It's become more, the world's become more homogenized, right? We've lost, it's a profound loss that we had, we can never get back. But on the other hand, uh, you know, from a real kind of narrow ecological perspective, the, the, the Hawaii is probably more resilient now than it was. It's more resilient to change now. It has much more functional diversity, it has much more species diversity than it had. Um, and so from that kind of real utilitarian perspective, probably the Hawaiian ecosystem in, in some ways is maybe more resilient to future climate change, other human impacts than it was, than it was a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago. All right, and I'll just end here very quickly and say that, you know, the other thing that people have said, we got to, even more so than we have been doing is thinking explicitly about how humans value and, and uh, value and are impacted by invasion and really incorporate that into our management much more so than we have already. And this is just a picture here. This is Lantana camera, real, um, it's an ornamental plant here in, in California around the world. Uh, and it's been a real bad invader in, in India, and here um, there was uh, it, it, the it's been used to start a furniture making industry in part because the um, native bamboo forests have declined for various reasons, including the invasion of Lantana camera. And so this management kind of approach has now incorporated this local industry as an integral part of the management efforts that they've been doing in um, for Lantana.
And sorry, that's it. I've went over than an hour, so I've talked on for for too that's long. Good. But thank you. That's good. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Excellent presentation. Questions? Anybody have questions for Dr. Lambrinos? Yes. Yeah, uh, I found it interesting about rewilding. Um, so he said, uh, you said uh, there used to be big predators, for example, in North America, right? Hello? Yep, yep. Oh, OK. And then, um, and then uh, pygmy elephant and pygmy mammoths on Catalina Island. Yep. Can't that, be, can't that be used as an example of even though we do remove species, the ecosystem will adapt anyway? Yes. So, um, well, I wouldn't use the word adapt. I would say that I like to think about, um, I describe it in terms of changes, right? So we remove a species, you add a species, the ecosystem changes. And ecosystems are sort of dynamic in, in various ways over time and over space. And one of the, the changes is it loses a mammoth, right? It loses a, a section of large mammals and those and those change, right? Um, and so the, the ecosystems are always gonna be dynamic and they, they're dynamic over thousands of years, millions of years. The, those, uh, the North American ecosystems look very different than they did 60 million years ago, right? Um, but sort of that change, that dynamic change is a, I think a distinct kind of issue or question from how those changes, you can put it in very sort of direct terms, how those changes affect human well-being, right? How, how we interact with those ecosystems and the sort of the benefits we get from those ecosystems. And parts of those benefits are things like, you know, we want, we're, we feel a sense of loss that we've lost those, those birds in Hawaii, right? That now, mm -hmm. that no yeah. longer we're listed, existing with, or we have a sense of loss, we lost that pygmy mammoth, right? And it's unclear what happened to the pygmy mammoth, but one hypothesis is that we killed it, we overhunted it, right? Um, so yeah, so it's, it, I think ecosystems are dynamic and they change over, over time. And, but I think I, I sort of, there's kind of two different issues there, right? There's sort of our, our changes and what that means for us and the ecosystem and the, the broader change that happens to all ecosystems. It's also, it's also a rate, right? It's also, it, it's also you know, losing the mammoth or, or introducing a new critter is, that's always gone on, right? That's, that's, that's life on earth, right? There's always changes. But one of, the, one of the worries is with species introductions or climate change or other things is that are, are the changes happening faster than the systems can, can adapt to them or can evolve and, and, and you know, losing a pygmy mammoth probably sucked back in the days, um, you know, back in the day, but now we're losing a pygmy mammoth and the vegetation and, uh, you know, the, the worm and the fungus. And, you know, so at some point the, the, the system's ability to be resilient, as John was mentioning, um, will be harmed when you when things just either get lost or get so scrambled up that they 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 aren't stable. Um, they aren't. They, you know, we have this notion of this sort of dynamic equilibrium or this alternative stable state. And if we're constantly poking, 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 at some point the system is like you know flopping up and down, and we don't we don't have predictions in terms of pollinators or whatever. So the problem is not actual change itself, but the the rate of change as we're doing because there's no way to stop and change right i mean that's just evolution i mean evolution is just a constant in biology so so what we should be focusing on is just how to control the rate of change well if, i I, th I think it's it's both yeah so it's, it's both uh it's both the the frequency but it's also the magnitude there, there's you know removing a pygmy mammoth is one thing but if we removed multiple aspects or, or simultaneously change multiple aspects of the system th there's also a you know a, 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 the magnitude of that perturbation itself is potentially a problem yeah, yeah so we're you know we're it's it's hard to see from our perspective of our time frames of being humans but we're basically right in the very beginnings of one of another <laughs> great mass extinction event, right? 
in which not only the species are changing, but the entire kind of earth system is changing. And, you know, we, there's been like six other ones that have happened. And there's been a few that have happened over a very short period of time. So the event that killed off the dinosaurs in the Cretaceous happened from a meteor event. So there's probably things went wrong for like in a day, right? And mm -hmm. probably most of the dinosaurs had bit the bullet maybe within a month or two because there was no sun, right? So that's kind of an anomaly. Most other things, although they happen extremely fast on geologic time scales, they were, um, they're extremely slow on human time scales. So other, they, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, we're, we've compressed those changes that we've been seeing in the past, those past mass extinctions into the span of 150, 200 years, basically. And basically since 1950, uh, so even shorter period of time. So it's a traumatic rate of change. And so we're basically saying we've created, we're gonna, we've created a world where we're gonna live through a mass extinction event. We've created it. We're gonna say our kids, their kids and their kids are going to live through the end of the Cretaceous. Good times. <laughs> Living the dream. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, it's, it's a, there's all kinds of really, so uh, the, the notion of uh, the Jeremy was talking about that rewilding is, is pretty interesting, right? So some of the, some of the, um, was, there's one that's, it's the shifting baselines thing, how quickly we get used to the change conditions and think that that's okay. Um, and, uh, and we have this notion of, of nature is sort of humans, not part of nature, right? That like all this restoration stuff, the fences are bad because there are people there, et cetera. I mean, there's, there, there are um, journal logs from the European captains that were coming into the Caribbean. And there's, you always have to be careful when you read these old journals, right? Because some of these guys are probably, you know, drinking, uh, you know, lead laced wine and stuff like that. But, but still, um, they talk about going from these islands, you know, in, in Cuba and these in the Antilles and all these things, and actually seeing like a constant layer of sea turtles. So between these small islets or these little Ks, who knows what that means? It's probably just like the buffalo, right? I mean, like horizon to horizon, solid animals. And these are sea turtles, right? These are large, these are a meter, two meter diameter shelled critters, thousands and thousands, and, and not, not like occasionally, but <clears throat> it was the norm to encounter these organisms in, in, these, in these shoal areas. And if you think about that, uh, the sea turtles, though that's a lot of biomass, they're consuming a lot of stuff. They're probably munching seagrass down to nubs. So when we think of seagrass, we tend to think of seagrass as this very long, you know, like a, a foot long or a meter long of, of you know, thallus uh, that's just sort of floating in the water and there's things growing on it. But if you imagine, you know, a buffalo herd coming through, they just mow that stuff down to nothing instantly. And so the the, the dynamics of it, that ecosystem are radically different. Like think of like what John was talking about, those sort of mud flat uh, 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 diatom and, and single sheet cell uh, algal dominated mud flats versus a vegetated marsh with, you know, meter high vegetation, really different dynamics. And so, so I think as things get scarier and scarier and as the pendulum sort of swings more and more with climate change and disturbance and stuff i think it 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 argues that we should do more experimentation of trying to introduce these weird things or things that aren't quote unquote supposed to be there because stuff is we're, we're perturbing the system right and left all the time right bang 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 and at some point we want to have some response to that that pushing on the pendulum kind of thing yeah, that's a, and that's a big kind of part of that rationale for sort of thinking about, you know, what do we want, you know, as these systems are changing and how, as they're rearranging themselves or basically we're rearranging them in an uncontrolled way, are there ways that we can, can manage that rearrangement? And can we, and one, the argument is that one way to think about that is what are the functions, what do we want this ecosystem to look like? Right, to sort of a very different way from when restoration ecology started off, right? Which was, we're gonna look in the past 
And that's the, what we want this ecosystem. Before we came in and screwed it up, right? You want to go back to what it looked like in the, in the past. But this, there's a shift, which is like, well, maybe what is the, that, that past has no relevance anymore. We got to reimagine what we want those ecosystems to, to look like in terms of if their ecology, right? Their biodiversity, the various functions. And it's a very, it makes people uneasy because it's a very different way from which restoration in particular was sort of formulated. Have you ever heard of uh, this place called Tiger Canyons in uh, South Africa? Because it yeah. reminds me a lot about rewilding and that's what they're doing in South Africa is that they're buying large plots of land uh, from a bunch of farmers and, uh, and then they release, you know, the local wildlife and everything, but as well as uh, they, they try to rewild tigers. So um, any kind of tiger, I guess, I'm not sure the genetics of it or anything, but I know they have Bengals, Siberians, and uh, uh, Sumatran tigers. And uh, would that be sort of the same thing? I mean, we could probably do that in North America if we can. Yeah, I think that's very, that's, that's very much the same, the same thing. And um, uh, you know, part of the part of the there's kind of other aspects. That rewilding is sort of a kind of a a general term, and people use it in lots of kind of different ways. So, in one way, they another more general way that people use rewilding is kind of try and restore um, uh, over very large landscapes more sort of ecosystem functions over. So, reconnecting rivers, getting rid of um, the flood control barriers and rivers, restoring some of that natural river flow, um, you know, integrating farmland more into that, into um, creating into a, a network of reserves, you know, creating networks of reserves along that. So some people sort of kind of create, call that rewilding, right? It was taking this, this kind of very domesticated landscapes that we've created and, and integrating them more into a more wild a more wild system, right? But the, the more kind of the more narrow aspect of that is doing things like reintroducing, um, you know, big wide um, herding animals and big top predators. And we'll look for those functional equivalents, even if, you know, in some cases have gone extinct, right? And, it, and the added benefit is, you know, we know that lions are going extinct. Lions are threatened, right? So one way to help preserve lions is to get a population of lions here in North America, right? As an example. Mm -hmm. that, that specific um, idea hasn't gone past like beer three at the uh, conservation <laughs> biology meeting. But it'd be awesome. <laughs> I mean, so, but we are we are doing that with with grizzly bears, there, right? I mean, we're rewilding uh, areas of Idaho and, and and sort of the Bitterroot wilderness and stuff like that. And we're in effect, we haven't talked about fisheries yet, but that's coming up. But and fisheries successes, but one of the successes has been um, our shark rewilding, right? So our great white sharks are coming back to the California coast, and uh, not not in the sense of intentionally introducing them, but by reducing their their uh, fishing, but by, by, by reducing the killing of them, the populations are recovering. And I think that's great. I think that's really cool. But Joe Blow going to the beach on summertime at, you know, July 4th weekend, they're like, wait, what? I want my kids to go in the water. I don't want one of those quote unquote predators out there. And so, so there is something different when you, so there's definitely the stuff that John's talking about connecting rivers. Uh, 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 having these large herding organisms, whether they're fish or some kind of ungulate or whatever, those are cool. Most people are cool with that, right? Most people are like, oh, that's cool, or that looks interesting, or that kind of looks like a nature special. But when you introduce something that can eat you, a lot of people are like, uh, wait, what? No, I don't know about that. I don't want that much wild. I just want the nice wild. I just want the, I want the kitty cat. I don't want the snake kind of thing. And that's and so that that that's absolutely part of this whole issue with invasions and species specific management and stuff. It's it's the popular conception is hugely important in terms of how we take actions and how we fund the efforts and all that kind of stuff. So popular opinion cannot be dissociated from the, the theoretical management options that are available. <laughs> 
Other questions? Every, anybody, somebody else has some questions for uh, Dr. Lambrinos about invasions or something wasn't clear or anything you're wondering about? I had possibly two comments. One that um, if, if we removed some of the man-made structures, wouldn't that allow nature to come back on its own rather than rewilding, such as the dam removals in, on the Elwha River? Because um, it seems to be coming back beautifully on its own. Yes, definitely. So in, in some in some cases, what what you need to do is simply remove the remove the uh, human structures like a dam, or more broadly the, the the perturbations that we have caused. It could be could be nitrogen in the soil, right? Um, it could be the, the fire regime or the fire regime that we've changed because we're doing fire suppression, things like that. Uh, simply changing those, those physical forces, right, is, is enough to, to recalibrate the scales and give native species a chance to, to recolonize and reestablish themselves. Very good. But there are, there are cases where, where that's not sufficient for for various reasons like like the um because we become isolated right these populations have we've 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 modified the landscape so much on such a big scale right if we at the scale which we're doing our restoration right is small then what's going to recolonize if we give native species that uh, uh, leg up, right? They have to get there first, right? And they're not going to get there in time before some other species comes in, a non-native species, which is more abundant. So uh, each sort of specific case is is different, I think. Um, but as you, the Elwha is a good example of that, right? You mentioned the removing the dam and uh, just restoring that natural flow uh, native species. And we saw some aspects of this, you know, just when the initial, when we initially went into lockdown, right, how quickly, how quickly species and wildlife and native species could respond, right, we simply, we, we reduced car traffic by 50%, right. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, or see if you had any comment about was um, the fact that the agricultural industry in California is, is, um, is the highest order, but nurseries are a very large part of that. But within each of these nurseries, they are not all selling native plants. They're selling ornamentals. They're selling, um, like you say, the pampas grasses. Is there any control over that in, in Oregon? Yeah, the short answer is no, <laughs> but the, there's a broader answer. So the um, so Oregon has a really big nursery industry as well. I think it by by value, dollar value, it's the biggest industry in the state, and it most of the of the temperate um, the the temperate plants, woody plants that are that are grown in the or they're sold in the U.S. Come a lot of it comes from Oregon conifer trees and things like that. So like in California, the it, it, they produce they produce species that are mostly non-native species, right? And for a long time, I showed you that picture from Golden Gate Park. There's nothing native, <laughs> even back then. So I, there's cool records from when they were building Golden Gate Park. The 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 director of Golden Gate Park had would go down to the dock and he would he had lists of these boxes of plants which were coming from New Zealand, that were coming from Australia, that he was they was trialing. Uh, to, to grow out in Golden Gate Park. So it's been a, we have a long history. We just sort of, I think part of it is we just like, we're, we like plants and all sorts of plants. The, it's a sort of a, it's a diversity of plants, right? So it's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that some of these plants actually are so successful because they are able to grow in downtown San Francisco, right? Under, under a, you know, a mile of concrete, completely, you know, without ever getting watered, in sort of super ozone, high super ozone level. So just for example, uh, so vine maple is a, is a native plant here in the Northwest. It's a nice, beautiful tree. It's sort of an understory, understory tree. If you planted a vine maple 
um, in downtown Portland, they would die within a month, <laughs> right? And so everyone plants Norway maple, right? Which is a non-native thing. It's a real common uh, street tree. So there's sort of reasons, there's some reasons for, for having this diversity of, of plants that are, that are beyond simply the native plants. And, uh, and that's hard to change, right? The sort of economics of that industry are hard to change. Um, but the other aspect of it is the industry has, the, has gotten a little bit better in terms of trying to reduce, so that nursery pathway is one of the main pathways that non-native plants have been distributed around the world and, and invasive plants have come through that nursery trade. And so the industry has gotten a little bit better in, in, in kind of trying to regulate itself in terms of, you know, we're not going to send Norway maples to places where, where it's become invasive. Part of it is, is regulation, but they've also gotten a little bit more, not, not a whole lot, but they've gotten a little bit more um, uh, responsive to, to realizing that many of these plants become invasive in certain contexts, right? And being responsive about not about not contributing to that. So what, So we have a, actually one of our faculty members here in our department is an ornamental plant breeder. And one of the things that he's been breeding is sterile plants, sterile horticulture plants that are presumably less invasive. So I've actually, we have a project with them trying to, and we were doing some population modeling to, um, to see on butterfly bush. There's been all these kind of various sterile forms of butterfly bush that have been promoted as being you know, non-invasive. And we're kind of actually, there's some worry about that they're not actually not invasive for various reasons. So we're, we're actually doing a little study to, to, to look at that. Um, so it's a complex question because it, 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 it comes into sort of kind of the demand people have for plants, how that demand is formulated by sort of the promotions of what plants are available, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, kind of a complex question, but the, yeah, you know, I think it's going to be very difficult to, to say we're only going to sell native California plants as ornamental landscaping plants in California. It's a very, it's a very difficult kind of, kind of thing to do in, a, in an overall way, right? I think it's going to have to come from individual people saying, we like native. We like native plants. We want to use more native plants, and that's going to sort of generate uh, generate an interest in and develop the industry in that native plant in that native plant industry. But I think that's starting to happen. So if you look at um, a Thousand Oaks, if you look at Moore Park, if you look at some cities, at least around here, around us in the Bay Area, um, where um, sometimes it's coming because people are worried about natives, like like John is saying, in other cases, it's because of drought. And it's just like, oh my God, we, we, ha we have to rip up the medians, et cetera. And so, so starting to pull out the old stuff and put in, um, again, not all natives, but less problematic invasives. And some of them are like from South Africa or Australia because they're drought tolerant or whatever. But, but I've seen a huge shift. When I first moved down, when I first moved down here 15 years ago, it was, there's one nursery that you could get native plant stuff at. Now there's more. To be sure, the vast majority is still the exotic whatever. But when you think about it, like why the hell does everybody want to have lily of the Nile? Like, well, you know, what, what, there's, there's, so there's John's right in that there's some species are clearly selected because they're hardy or they, they, they do well in this human dominated landscape. But a whole other host of them are like, why that one? You know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of plants around the planet. Like, why these handful that always show up everywhere? And it just, it's totally idiosyncratic, right? It's like because someone bred that one and somebody liked the color a hundred years ago, and then it started growing, growing, growing. So we can um, we can have influence on that. And and John's right. It's about it's about choice and it's about. Um, you know, spending the dollars and, and having the industry see there's a signal and a value for that. Yes, because I realized that the, a lot of those plants are not water wise. The other thing is when they're growing them, they use a ton of fertilizers. Yeah. So, um, and, and all of that's running into our waterways and uh, anyway. 
Awesome questions. I wanted to make sure. Does anybody else have any other uh, burning questions? We're almost out of time. Any any general things weren't clear, or any any really interesting comments that you that you were inspired or you were wondering about? Oh, wait till everyone else has a because they might be. I just want to give a general compliment. Um, your presentation was really well done, and I like how you incorporated so many different examples. It was really definitely very interesting. Oh, thank you. Good job. Excellent. Other comments, folks? Lots very of thumbs good up. job. Very informative, sir. Thank you. Yeah, say the same thing. Thanks, very informative, Lord. very Thank interesting. You. So a lot of those, a lot of the things that Dr. Lambrino's talked about, they're they're in our readings. Um, some of which come directly out of some of the readings that he shared with us. Others are are very similar to other other ideas. So um, I think I think uh, it'll make a lot of sense to you guys when you when you get to those. And uh, and I'll uh, as soon as we end here today, I'll and this thing gets rendered, I'll I'll put the, uh, his lecture up with those things as well. Awesome. Wait wait can can, can I ask oh, some more? Sorry, sorry sorry Jeremy has another question. Go ahead. Dude. Yeah, so uh, I, I was looking at a lot of videos in, uh, in Florida, for example, there's a lot of invasive species like iguanas. Um, <laughs> but then apparently you anaconda. could just like take them off. Yeah, and anaconda, you know, you know all those, all those must have just, like snakeheads and everything. But apparently you can take them all and they're all just free food. So I'm just wondering is can you use invasive species to feed populations? Yeah, so um, yes, there's been various, I'm, I'm not trying to think of an example of of like one that's been really, really successful, like where it became a big industry. And I can't, I'm not, I can't think of an example, but there's lots of other kind of smaller scale examples. So for instance, um, uh, um, snakehead, I think it was snakehead. I was in Baltimore at a, at a, for an ESA meeting and I was in a restaurant and they had, they were serving snakehead, snakehead mm -hmm. as like, so it's an invasive, invasive Ooh. fish. Um, and uh, they were, it was a uh, snakehead fish and chips, like, and they were, it was, they were promoting it as, as, um, you know, help, help save the, help save the waterways of Maryland by eating the <laughs> snakehead fish. Um, but I'm, so there's been lot, there's lots of examples, um, kind of small scale examples like that, where people were, as part of, pretty initially as a, as a management aspect of it. Um, that that people have been encouraged to include uh, non-native species as food items, but also I think people have also included them just because they're there. As as they got more and more abundant, um, they they started including them as part of their um, as part of their their kind of their food system. But I'm trying to. I'm, it's a good question. I'm trying to think of, there must be an, a really good example of one where it's become a real, like a real important or significant fishery or, or some, some harvest or incorporated into a, into a food system in a, in a big way. I'm, it's, I'm blanking on a, in a really like dramatic example. Well, I mean, there's, there's like introduced, a lot of introduced fish species are intentionally introduced. I mean, I mean, it, it's not exactly like, uh, Jeremy's talking about, but but you know, there's many of the lakes and rivers, for example, in California, are are introduced with things that weren't native here, and then in other parts of the world, a lot of what we would consider na uh, native to us, uh, California, you know, rainbow trout have been introdu introduced to New Zealand uh, rivers, and so and in both cases, one of the responses is to go and and fish them. Although in those cases, they were intentionally introduced to be a to be a food thing, they they weren't accidentally introduced, and then we started an industry after them. But, but, um, there, but, it's it's so Nutria in Louisiana, which is a, a animal that was brought in from South America, and then essentially for for fur, and then escaped and is in his um, in the '30s and has been attacking marshland wetlands. Um, there's been repeated efforts to try to put bounties on these critters and to have chefs try to prepare new ways to cook them, to induce people to, to, um, to kill them in the marsh and then, and then consume them. But um, it, people kind of eat them and there's sort of an industry, but it's not like not everybody in, 
and their brother is frying these up for county fairs kind of thing. So there's small examples, but there isn't really anything that just completely is on its own self-sustaining and just going. And you can imagine if it really did get going and it was self-sustaining, the population would crash, right? And so then you wouldn't, you wouldn't, it's kind of weird. We, we, we want to drive it to extinction is what we want to do, right? But then, but then whenever you have a situation, you do that, then the, econ the economics don't make sense because it's going to be gone after a little bit, right? That's true. <laughs> okay, all right. Any other last comments before we let uh, Dr. Lambrinos go? All right, cool. So, um, so I'm going to kill the recording. If you guys do want to hang out and ask him any uh, personal question or two or a specific question or two, um, uh, we're good to go. But uh, other than that, um, I'm going to shut this sucker down. I'll be emailing everyone the revised version of or uh, uh, posting into the module and then emailing everybody that's there in um, for our uh, survey uh, data uh, in the next few hours or so. So uh, thanks, John. That was great. And uh, again, I'm going to leave us on and I hope everybody has a good rest of the week and I will see everybody next Monday. Thank you. Thank you.